everyone, and welcome to a fall edition of the Filmocracy podcast. Once again, joined by John Fitzgerald, CEO of iGems and co-host of this podcast. Wow, it felt like every episode was a summer episode, and now it's suddenly fall, and it's roaring into the season. Yeah, How are you doing? It's, it's, these are exciting times. I mean, for us cinephiles, right? Fall festival season is when things really kick into high gear. Not just in terms of quality of movies, but uh, I know with filmocracy, tons of tons of action. It does really feel like this is the first like kind of normal ish year mm -hmm. since the pandemic. Like everybody's kind of going back to the way they used to do business, and even though some are doing hybrid stuff, it's definitely an in-person <laughs> thing that's happening, movement that's happening now, and everybody's excited. There's a lot of people. There's not a lot of masks, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> so yeah, maybe, John, you can catch us up on on the fall circuit. Yeah, well, I think to your point, Paul, I mean, you and I were in Toronto last year, and you know, we were we were greeted at the door and reminded to put our masks on, right? Every, every time we came to the hotel. And I think, you know, it is a different time. Um, well, we still have half an eye on what's happening with COVID. I think, uh, you know, for these big fall festivals, uh, it's, it's interesting because they're all entirely in person. You know, we kicked everything off a few weeks ago in Venice, um, some strong titles there. And and then moved into to Telluride over Labor Day weekend, and then of course uh, Toronto kicked off, and all of these festivals are only in person, and I th I find that interesting, and maybe we'll we'll kind of dust that off a little bit later, but you know Sundance has announced that they're coming back uh, with a hybrid next year, and a lot of other festivals are doing hybrid, but these big fall festivals want to be in person, and I, I can understand Venice, right, because they're kind of the the oldest and the snobs and you know it's their thing and cinephiles but for somebody like toronto i kind of was a little surprised i have to say yeah i mean i think the real reason all of these festivals are coming back in person is because people love giving standing ovations you know we <laughs> there's so much news i don't know if it's because people have not been in the theater together in a huge group uh in a while but you know brendan fraser's movie the whale got a six minute standing ovation in venice and then bones and all got a nine minute standing ovation <laughs> in vegas and then anna de armas's movie got a 14 minute standing wow. ovation right and i think brendan fraser got an award an acting award right from from one of the fests at, at, i think venice I feel like it was, was it venice yeah, I mean, it's supposed to be a, a knockout performance. Yeah, it's uh Oh, and one more, Banshees of Inishirin got a 13 minute standing ovation in Vegas. <laughs> this is a long time. If, for those of you listening who haven't been in a standing ovation, that's a really long time to clap. And the whole time, at least for me, I'm just like All right. I can't leave. You can't leave. <laughs> You can't leave during a standing ovation. It's just like, that would be so rude. You got to wait it out. You got to wait it out. Well, let, let's unpack a, a few of these films real quick. And then um, and then I think we should talk a little bit about Toronto because it's still going. And there's there's a lot of interesting uh, double-edged swords fighting each other there. But um, I, I I think, you know, it goes without saying that, that the fall season is the most important festival season. Uh, and, and for a lot of reasons it kind of comes down to two awards, you know, sadly. A, a lot of the studios are, are pushing their their prestige pictures, gunning for Oscars. And I thought it was interesting today, uh, Eric Cohn at IndieWire wrote a, a great piece about how, you know, the studios are, are, are kind of in a way trying to reclaim <laughs> their position. Last year, uh, of course, CODA, acquired out of Sundance for what, 20, $25 million or whatever it was, it kind of sneaks away with the best picture. And, uh, and this year you've got, you know, you've got a lot of big buzz titles with big celebrities, big studio movies, uh, you know, Babylon. To, yeah. Did you hear they showed a trailer for that at Toronto? And <laughs> how was the response? 
like through the roof, right? It's Margot Robbie and and Brad Pitt. But what the crazy thing is, it wasn't even the movie; it was the trailer. <laughs> and there was a ten minute standing ovation for the trailer. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> right. But yeah, so they're 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 sneaking that out a bit, and and of course, um, you correct me if I'm wrong here, Paul, but I feel like Spielberg's first time in Toronto. Uh, was this year, uh, and they, they showed the Fablemans, which everybody's raving about. So, mm -hmm. an absolute lock for a best picture nomination and an autobiographical look at his parents' divorce and, and kind of his er, er, early, early rumblings about being a filmmaker. I'm sure he's the kid's got a camera in his hand. I mean, I haven't seen it, I didn't go to Toronto this year, but it, it sounds and looks amazing. Yeah, it's been a been a hot minute since he's really been that active i think in that sense um he's done some like executive producing but producing is a little bit different right so it's interesting for him to make a comeback and it seems like looking at his his like upcoming stuff he's got actually a lot happening he seems to be like reactivated <laughs> to start doing work again yeah and you heard you know he heard he did uh the 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 Mumford video right the, he he literally yeah. with an iPhone directed the music video for oh uh, yeah for, his, for the title track I think it was maybe maybe it's not the title track but it's the opening song I think on Mumford's solo album uh, which he talks about abuse I guess it's a pretty intense album um, but yeah so so Spielberg <laughs> Spielberg directed it with an iPhone. Um, but yeah, and then so what else? So so uh, the the blonde movie, uh, the Mary Monroe biopic, premiered at Venice. That that was certainly generating some buzz. And then there, there's of course the the cannibal movie with <laughs> Chalamet. Did you hear about that one? I did. It's actually been received pretty well, despite the subject matter. What's it called? <laughs> Bones and all. Yeah. I think that's the one that got a, a standing ovation for for like 10 minutes or something, nine minutes. Yeah, it's it's supposed to be pretty intense. I mean, very cinematic, but it, at the end of the day, it's, I think the quotes are, it was so insane and fucked up, but, you know, in the best possible way. <laughs> but yeah, cannibals. Yeah. Who knew? In the mainstream. Mm -hmm. They're on a comeback. So let's so let's unpack what's happening in Toronto because it seems like I, I think we talked about this before. Uh, I've always said, even since I was at AFI a gazillion years ago, you know, when I got to go to Toronto, I felt like that was the best festival all around. They they really took care of the industry, unlike you know Cannes and Berlin where you got to wait in line for tickets for the next day's events. I mean, you got your pass in Toronto. And you got to see anything you wanted to see. You showed up at your your industry screening, and there's always a seat for you. And great parties. You met everybody, and uh, and then of course they took care of the local community. Galas galore, the red carpet and the whole nine yards. People taking their their work vacations during the festival to be out and about and see great films. But but I feel like there's there's been a strange turn where I I, I wonder. Paul, if they're trying to do too much. Yeah, I mean, they do everything, right? And they're probably one of the best integrated, like, industry and normal population festivals out there where it doesn't feel exclusive. Like, a lot of people yeah. will, will plan around it just because you get such access that you wouldn't normally get as a regular fan. Um, but I think, yeah, that just comes with a whole host of responsibilities, but also criticisms. And they're a little bit under the microscope in a sense too, just because it draws so much attention and kind of the society we live in today is, is kind of like that, right? Like everybody's kind of nitpicking and trying to find what could be better, which is in some ways good, but it's also like, it's good to hold organizations and events to a higher standard, but it's also on almost impossible task. It feels like mm -hmm. um, there's a couple of pieces of news that came out of Toronto. The first one is there's a movie called The People's Joker, which is a queer movie set. It's a parody 
in the Batman universe. And so parodies shouldn't be um, you know, controlled under like copyright because they're parodies, but apparently it was forced to not participate because of Warner Media since they have the rights to the DC universe. <laughs> so they're obviously very upset. Um, and I've heard some pretty great things about this film and it should be considered fair use, but you know, at the end of the day, it's a, it's a commercial enterprise. And if Warner media says, we're not going to work with you Toronto, if you show this film, then what's really Toronto supposed to do? Yeah. I, mean, I know what I would do if I were Toronto, I'd be like, well, Warner media is going down you know, going down the <laughs> hole. So maybe it's not even worth dealing with you and your demands anymore. Who knows? Yeah, the politics at that level gets gets pretty intense. I mean, not to shift gears to, to Sundance, but I mean, for many years, they they had to deal with their own dramas, right? Because, you know, uh, they're showing a lot of movies that, you know, Sony Classics and Miramax and Fox Searchlight, and a lot of these mini majors, had already acquired and they were kind of leveraging their relationships to to have a lot of these movies take up slots at Sundance and and they went through a number of years where people were saying it was just too political and they were you know showing a lot of alumni films and I don't know that's a whole other that's a whole other podcast I guess but but I think to, back to Toronto it sounds like you know you said something about um, Hillary being flown in and, and a lot of double standards there. So I thought there was some interesting play there. Yeah, it is. I mean, Hillary Clinton as secretary of state had a lot of, you know, things happen under her eight years where she, you know, went after Julian Assange and there's a lot of, you know, prosecution and extraditions happening. And it begs the question of like, what does TIFF stand for then? because TIFF also has a documentary from uh, another journalist who mm -hmm. is Iranian. Mm -hmm. His name is Jafar Pahani and his film No Bears is in the festival. So it's kind of like a person who typically goes after people like this filmmaker or actually in her <laughs> career went after those people. Right. Her former and life. And they're in the same festival. And I don't know if that, I mean, I guess you could argue that it's good to have like both sides of something, mm -hmm. but also like with the Taylor Swift thing, having her short and flying out there, you know, like are, I guess is, is TIFF becoming too commercial for its own good? Yeah, or, about the press. Or is that like a method of like, you have to cater a little bit to celebrity and that will allow other people to discover Films like No Bears from Jafar Pahani that maybe they wouldn't normally hear about if it were a mm -hmm. smaller festival. Like there's always like two sides of this, right? Like, and it, I think it's almost like the startup thing. It's like, would you rather be, have a small piece of a huge pie? In this case, it would be Tiff is the pie and you can be a slice of it, but the pie can only be so big if you have Hillary Clinton and, you know, Taylor Swift coming. Or yeah, should yeah, you just and Steven be... Spielberg. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, or should you be a smaller festival that's like more about representation and then maybe you're not as popular and then you're not TIFF anymore? Yeah, it is an interesting question. I think the truth is it, it, it has become the biggest film festival in North America. I mean, some would argue Sundance is in some ways more important for American indies, maybe. But in terms of just... The, the sheer scope and import and budget and cost. I mean, studios spend tons of money to, to essentially make these festival screenings in Toronto, their, you know, their fall press junket, <laughs> you know, it really helps to kick off wh whatever movie it is they're, they're kicking off. And so it, it has become big business in a way. And, and yeah, it goes with the territory, but you know, when, when you read articles about Taylor Swift, who has certainly done her thing in music and done it very well, kind of jumping into the film landscape and, and, and people saying she's gunning for an Oscar for her short film. So talented. 
<laughs> so Where does deserving. it end? Where does it end? <laughs> um, well, anything else on Toronto, or, or should we shift gears to to other other items in the news? I think we should shift gears, but I, I do want to make the Batman quote <laughs> relevant again, which is either die the hero or live, live long enough to become the villain. And I remember when I first heard that quote in the movie, I was like, this is a dub quote. It's like, <laughs> it's like just trying to like, you know, talk about Batman becoming the villain. But if you think about it, it kind of fits that idea of like, the longer you exist, you kind of only exist because you do the things that you make you the villain. Like you have to be the villain to survive mm -hmm. that long and have that much success. And this is a whole other topic that I could talk about, like capitalism and startups and <laughs> and how every every large corporation is evil and why. But we'll we'll move past that. We'll save that for another podcast. Yeah, the capitalism we'll episode. <laughs> Awesome. Well, I, I just thought there are a few interesting ideas uh, and and sad things that, that are taking place in the news. But let's let's start on a high note. Um, I think it's a great thing for Sundance that they got Eugene Hernandez uh, to step in, uh, and you know I I think he's he's going to jump into to the role as 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 director and he'll oversee programming and all that. I think in in 2024. But the fact that they were able to bring him in. Um, everybody's saying, and I agree that it, it, it's, it's a cool thing. And it, 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 in some ways comes full circle because he's been such a mainstay in park city for so many years. I mean, when, when he was first starting Indie wire, he was there all the time. And I remember seeing him and talking to him about everything that was happening. He was always at South by Southwest. He was a, he was an integral part of, of kind of this, this evolving independent film landscape. And then of course he went to Lincoln center where he ran, the New York Film Festival and and uh, you know publisher of Film Comment. So he's 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 had a huge impact on the space. So so kudos for Sundance for for bringing him in. And I just kind of wanted to give a shout out there. Do we know what happened to Tabitha? We don't. We don't. It, it, it's a little bit sad, I think, because obviously she came in at a really difficult time. Yeah. Um, having to inherit the reins during COVID, uh, it definitely wasn't an easy go. I, I I didn't hear anything specific from one person, but I did hear enough rumblings that it was it was kind of a mutual thing. Like I, I don't think it was going so well, and I think she kind of she has other things she wants to do. And if it wasn't if it wasn't rosy, and it wasn't going to be what she thought it was going to be. It was it was kind of a mutual parting is, is what I heard, but I didn't hear any dirt. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, probably something along the lines of you have hopes and dreams of how you're gonna make your stamp on an organization and event, and then COVID wrench prevents you from doing anything, and then the politics of everything keep you from doing everything. So I I don't I'm not surprised. It's a tough job, it seems like. Yeah, it's a lot of pressure. It's a lot of pressure that that job, and and a lot a lot coming at you that you didn't anticipate, and certainly a, a lot of politics, and yeah. a lot of a, a lot of finger pointing if everything doesn't go the right way. So, um, anyway, so the uh, the other the other thing in the news that that we certainly can't ignore is uh, the passing of Godard and and his impact on on the film world. And I mean, he passed away at 91 yesterday. I, I, I feel like I read it was assisted suicide, but um, certainly lived a long, fruitful life. And um, when I took my first history of film course in Santa Barbara, I remember watching Breathless and thinking, wow, this is pretty cool. And, and just, and then having to, of course, learn the history of, you know, Cahiers du Cinema and the auteur theory and the French New Wave. I mean, it just all came, you know, came came crashing down on me as a, as a film student. So I, I could see his impact. And um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, 
it's going to be interesting the next few weeks to see all the tributes and, you know, the top lists and all that kind of fun stuff. Yeah. It's, uh, it's interesting when you look at older films and you like, it was such a trailblazing world for mm -hmm. like the first like 60, 70 years. Like you were still able to do stuff that nobody else had done. But if you look at it in the context of like historically, they didn't have all of the tools and knowledge that we have so easily accessible today. And so the things that they did back then are like incredible, like mm -hmm. how to come up with that. And Jean-Luc Godard obviously was very influential on many of the filmmakers today, like just eschewing tradition and, you know, coming up with his own style that was more mm -hmm. realistic. And I, I remember I saw, I was watching this YouTube video, of the stunt coordinators and they're like watching older films and judging the stunts on them and like basically shitting on like all the new <laughs> shaky cam stuff right. and then they showed this charlie chaplin scene where or is it charlie chaplin i think it is where he's on the a train mm -hmm. the train's not moving that fast but he's like it's a real train and he's standing on the front of it. And then there's like a wood plank in front of the train that he has to use his own wood plank to hit that plank out of the way. Right. And you just think about it. Like when you watch it today, you're like, oh, that's silly. Like that's so easy. But like at the time that was like so dangerous, right? He has. No yeah. Lives. A lot of those guys did their own stunts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think oh, maybe Buster it was Buster Keaton. Keaton. It I might think have been was, Buster Keaton. Yeah. Did a lot of his own stunts. Yeah. Harold Lloyd. So I kind of like that. Like all of these older films, and all, many of them still hold up, obviously, but some of them where you're kind of like, oh, I've seen this before. You know, this is familiar. But it's because they were the one who yeah. like so made that chance. happen. Yeah. Yeah, so. yeah, I think I remember it's been a long time since I've seen Breathless, but I do remember the the black and white cinematography and and it was the first time i'd experienced jump cuts you know where they'd like be watching somebody move and then they would just cut forward and not to a different scene like the same scene but you know it was it was jarring in a way but it, but but interesting and and his use of pop culture and and music and 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 just you know in a way playful i mean obviously a rebellious sense of humor but um it was fun. The, the other movie that I really liked uh, was uh, Viva Savi, My Life to Live. This this was a film shot in 12 scenes uh, where Anna Karina, who he was married to for a short time, uh, plays plays this this young woman, and she's she's divorced recently, and and basically working in a record shop, and 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 meets a prostitute, and and ultimately decides you know this is a way for her to make some money, and it's. I don't want to give it away for those of you who haven't seen it and you can see it on HBO max right now. Uh, and a lot of uh, Godard's films are available on, on Amazon and criterion, obviously. But, um, this was one of the stronger ones I thought, and, uh, you know, a lot of social commentary, uh, which, which one, which is one of his trademarks, but, uh, but yeah, really, really intense, really intense. Um, Go ahead. So all you listeners have some homework after listening to this episode. <laughs> Out of respect for the master, go watch one Jean-Luc Godard film and all right. enjoy yourself. <laughs> yeah, and, and, re and report back. Um, the last thing I thought maybe I, I would just bring up, because again, you know, one of the things that, that we spent a lot of our time on is the whole film festival arena. And... Uh, of course, the Emmys were this week, and I just find it interesting, Paul, that you know some of some of our clients are are introducing uh, TV series and 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 episodic. Uh, obviously, docu series are are exploding. Uh, I wondered what you thought of that, and 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 do you think we're going to see more of that in film festivals um, in in the coming years with the growth of television? Definitely, I definitely am confused why that has not happened. But I think also like these award shows are losing a bit of their relevance, like their viewership is down. 
Mm -hmm. People don't really care that much about the actual show. Like the award itself is obviously prestigious and has impact, but like in terms of watching the actual show, I don't know, especially like younger people don't care yeah, about okay. watching. Like when the slap happened, that was a meme and like everybody was on it, but nobody <laughs> saw that live. You know, it was like one person saw it live and then posted it and it exploded. So, you know, it also, I think, begs the question of like, I mean, this is kind of like a conspiracy now online of like people wondering if the way that winners are chosen now is more to cater to fan tastes so that they're happy about it as opposed to like however the judges actually scored like maybe there's a a weighting system that they're changing like for example Lee Jung Hae who Lee Jung Jae who is the main actor in Squid Game like he's he's great in it he won best best male actor i think mm -hmm. um i don't think he was the but like I think there was a lot of really great mm -hmm. shows and a lot of great performances. I don't think he was number one, but obviously Squid Game was the most popular show of the year based on pure numbers. So it kind of makes sense that he won if that's <laughs> if that is the metric. So people are kind of suspicious on that, you know. And I guess yeah, and I, and I have to say I don't know enough about the TV Academy. So I, I know the numbers of memberships in the different categories for the for the academy like for the motion pictures mm -hmm. um and that's a lot harder to rig uh and it and, and it, it maybe it's it got more in the actors branch and some of the other branches and there's some issues there but with the tv academy i don't know and, and it, you raise a really interesting point which which we're actually going to write about a bit this week which is the balance between um kind of commercial sensibilities and what's working versus yeah. critical response, right? The Rotten Tomatoes and, and Metacritics, et cetera. And then the Academy that is actually supposedly voting on these things, right? Because those things aren't always in line. And I think for a long time, the Academy of Motion Pictures and Arts and Sciences were trying to, to find a way to pay more attention to mainstream even though it was the main, the, the blockbusters weren't necessarily getting attention by the Academy. It was the prestige pictures that didn't necessarily have the box office. And so they were trying to figure out how to balance that. And also to your point, raise the ratings, which they struggled to do year after year. And I think, as you just said, you know, the ratings continue. I think it, this was the lowest for the Emmys and, and you'd think it'd be just the opposite, right? Because this is, everybody was there this year, right? They weren't there last year. Yeah. So it's a little surprising that it was so low. It is too also because like obviously TV ratings across the board are down year after year, but it's the live events that usually still perform, mm -hmm. you know, especially like sports. And I guess, yeah, I mean, when you're trying to figure out who's going to win, like you want to be the first to know, don't you? But it also doesn't mm -hmm. seem like people need to watch the show to get that. They're happy to get a Twitter update where they can see the winners like in one thread instead of having to like sit through the show, right? This yep. is all probably social media's fault. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or or the streaming universe mm -hmm. or some twisted combination. Well, that's all I got for this week, Paul. You got anything else we should dive into? Um, well, I think just a, a last note is that we've got a lot of amazing film festivals this fall for Filmocracy. Um, and so joining our subscription is obviously the best time to do it would be the fall because there's so many festivals happening and so many great movies. Uh, but we also have our film market coming up, which is on October 6th and 7th in Topanga, California. So that'll be a hybrid event, first day in person, second day online our third edition of the film market. And it's basically you getting face-to-face -face time with executives and that's really hard to come by. So, you know, definitely check it out. You can learn more at festival.filmocracy.com slash film market. Yeah. And, and speaking of, of, of awards and, and, 
festivals. You know, one of our festival partners, the, the Lumiere Music Hall, was kind enough to partner with us, right, on uh, this kind of Oscar qualifying run for short films, which we're now nearly finished with our first week. And I know, Paul, you've got two more weeks coming up. So anybody in Los Angeles, check out the Lumiere Music Hall and you can see the short programs that are uh, hoping to be recognized. Yep. Yeah, I've seen them. They're mostly great, <laughs> mostly, but uh, <laughs> definitely head to the Lumiere, support your local cinema, and we will see you all next time on the Filmocracy podcast. Thanks, John. Thank you, Paul.